Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the Sheffield Health Diversity, Equity and Inclusion webinar series. It's great to have you with us here today. Um, just before I get started, I want to make you aware of a few housekeeping items. Um, firstly, for those who require live captioning, um, please find a link in the chat box. It's located on the right hand side of your screen. Um, you can copy and paste this link. Um, into a separate window in your web browser, you'll be able to watch the captions along with the webinar. Uh, you can also customize the color of the background text to suit your requirements. Um, secondly, um, as we go through the, the webinar, feel free to submit questions um, throughout um, the, the hour. Um, there's a question pad which is located on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, we're gonna try and leave some time towards the end, maybe 15 minutes um, at the end, after the panel discussion, to answer your questions. Um, just so you know, the webinar is recorded. Um, we will be receiving a copy, and you will receive a copy, sorry, after the end of this event, and we will upload it onto our YouTube channel. Um, so last year, we finished the year with a terrific conversation in New York on the path to racial equality on Wall Street. Uh, we start this year looking at disability inclusion, and we're gonna ask ourselves, has COVID created a new opportunity to attract and promote this dynamic talent pool? Are we seeing a step change for disability inclusion in the workforce? Now, for some of them, some of you who know or don't know, Sheffield Howarth is a challenger consultancy in people and transformational change. We challenge current thinking and we help leaders and companies to deliver on that change. Um, and I would say that since the pandemic, I know we've all had to deal with many, many challenges. And I'm sure, uh, like me, you're all pretty drained and frustrated by the lockdown. So I want today to be different. Our panel today are going to be looking at the positive aspects of disability inclusion. We're going to be looking at the opportunities for forward-looking corporate leaders and entrepreneurs to build better businesses and better service their customers. Now, I've been in the talent industry for 28 years, and during this time, one thing that has remained constant, it's the people and it's change that is central to organizations who want to build a better future. And I remember having a conversation with Sir Philip Craven, who used to be president of the um, International Paralympic Committee. And he told me, and it's in this comment has, has stayed with me for, for many, many years. He said, don't forget, disability is the largest minority group in the world that anyone can join at any stage of their lives. So a pretty powerful statement. Um, so enough from me. I want to welcome our panel, Mike Sharrett, Caroline Casey, uh, Toby Milden, and Shrim Madapati, who are here, delighted for you guys to join today. And I'm going to kick off really just by very simply saying, please introduce yourself, who you are, and what you do. Uh, Mike. Uh, yeah, hi. I'm Mike, Mike Sharrett, and I'm the CEO of the British Paralympic Association. And very briefly, our vision at the BPA is through sport to inspire a better world for disabled people. Thanks, Mike. Caroline. Um, I'm gonna just describe myself for anybody who can't see very well. I'm registered blind myself. Uh, I have blonde hair, I'm a white woman. I have Edna glasses, which are black and round. Um, I am Irish. I'm the founder of the Valuable 500. That is the global CEO community transforming disability business inclusion through leadership, business leadership and opportunity. I'm a troublemaker at heart and I am absolutely dying for this conversation. I've worn my pink flamingos for positivity. Yeah, well done, Caroline. Thank you. Um, Toby, please introduce yourself. Hi, it's lovely to see you. So I'm Toby and I'm a diversity and inclusion consultant. Uh, I work with HR directors in the technology sector in particular to help them create more inclusive cultures in their business so that um, a their employees can thrive and reach their full potential regardless of who they are but then they can also attract diverse talent and be seen as an employer of choice uh, within their sector great so thank you for that and Shren, last but not least <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot tim and uh, great to see everyone on, on on the panel today so uh, my name is Shren, i guess uh, so the best way to describe myself is, is somewhat of a serial technology entrepreneur, but was previously a, a, a solicitor. Um, so I originally founded a, a travel 
business in the accessibility field called Accommable that was acquired by Airbnb. And then I led the accessibility team within the accommodation sector of Airbnb for, for, for just over two years. Um, and left that relatively recently and so now doing a lot of technology advisory work and uh, on sort of and also working a bit on the angel investing side and working with a lot of other technology entrepreneurs to hopefully create great businesses. Great. Thanks very much, Rin. OK, so we've got an amazing panel today who are all looking at this subject and this topic um, from a different perspective. Um, I'm going to start in the sporting world because I remember um, it seems like a long time ago, I went to um, the Olympic Park to watch uh, the para-athletics championships, and I've been to see the Swimming World Championships as well there. Um, and um, I was just amazed by not only just watching elite sports people, but also the energy and positive t positivity of, of the crowds there. And, and, and um, I will never forget those feelings. Uh, Mike, I just want to ask you a question really about, you know, how do you think para-sport has changed perceptions of disabled people? And have you seen this change extended from the business of sport into the corporate world? Um, thanks, Tim. Um, well, first of all, delighted to be here today. Really excited to be on, to be on this panel. Um, I'm going to take you back, I think, to answer that question um, back to London 2012. I think London 2012, certainly for the UK and actually more than that um, globally, was a defining moment for the Paralympic movement. Um, I think, I mean, I was really lucky at the time. I, I was uh, in, in the park every single day during the Paralympics. And I could just sense that something very special was happening at that time. Um, if you remember back then in 2012, we had, you know, you couldn't get a ticket. Um, we had 80,000 people cheering spectators in every single session of athletics. Um, it was, and we had millions of people watching on TV. I mean, it was, it was I guess, what happened was that at scale, at a scale we hadn't seen before, so many people saw Paralympic sport as elite sport, which of course is what it is. Um, that was one part of the change that happened. I think the other part of the change that happened is that it really did have an impact on how people were thinking about disability. And, and in a way it shifted the narrative. It started to shift the narrative on disability and ability. And, and I think you know we owe a lot of thanks to Channel 4 in the way that they projected the athletes, it was just something that had never been done in that way before. Um, and I think research after London 2012 shows that it had made an impact. Um, but clearly, as we all know, there's an awful lot more that needs to be done. And disabled people are still less likely to have a job. They're still less likely to play sport. They're still more likely to feel excluded. Um, so in answer to your question in terms of extension to the business world, I would say, yes, it has. And there have been some really great examples where, where, where we have seen that, that, uh, that, that perception shift extending to the business world. I, I can talk to my own experience. I used to work at BP and, and I was lucky to be, to be leading BP's partnership with London 2012. And so I, I went off to Beijing when I started back in 2008 to see the Paralympics. I'd never seen them before. And I had, I guess it just blew me away. I just never experienced anything like that. It, it touched me in a, in, a, in a very special way. And so we came back, to, came back to London and decided to put the Paralympics right at the heart of, of our partnership with London 2012. And, and I think what I then saw over the next four years was how the Paralympics, and in particular, how a number of Paralympic athletes that we worked with, athlete ambassadors that we worked with, connected with people in a very special way at all levels in the company. It sort of really created a connection um, from the CEO right the way down. And I, th I think that for me was a, you know, was an, ex a, a, an opportunity just to see how the Paralympics can, can connect with people and with business. I, I, had, I had people across the company writing to me after the games to say how proud they felt of BP's uh, involvement with the games, but in particular with the Paralympics. I had parents of disabled kids writing to me saying it had given them new hope for what their child might be able to do in the future. And, and so there's just something very special here. Um, I remember going to see the CEO when on the day I left the day I left BP and we were reminiscing about London 2012 and and he it had been a difficult couple of years for BP before the before the games, and he described it as 
giving the firm you know, a chance to sort of to smile again almost um, as how he described it and you know and I think um, what I, I guess what I would say is that here at the BPA we are an elite sports organization but we're also a charity and, and we rely very heavily on business uh, on corporate partners and on, and on business to do what we do um, a lot of our funding comes from our corporate partners but what what um, what binds us in a sense you know we've got some fantastic partners and 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 what they look for is is for us to help them um, help to deliver a more inclusive working environment and that sort of sits at the heart of our partnership so I, I'd say Tim absolutely um, it's there there's a sort of um, that there is a sort of common set of values um, which are all around inclusion that underpins those partnerships yeah. um, and I think the final thing to say which I think is really encouraging is that coming out of COVID you know I've spoken to a lot of CEOs over the last few months um, and I'm sensing that one of the things that we're going to see coming out of COVID is many more business leaders seeking to bring more purpose into their into their business and for a purpose-led organization like the BPA, that's a that's a good thing. Yeah, well, that's great, and it's um, I like to hear the fact you know the impact, the smile on the CEO. And let, let's just think about the corporate world. And I'm gonna you know uh, I want to ask Caroline um, what you think is the current state of play within corporate leaders, and particularly not just their attitudes, but what actions are taking place towards disability inclusion, particularly from senior management. I mean, you've got a great lens on this, so. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, well, I'm going. I'm. I'm actually very hopeful um, because if you're talking about what COVID has delivered for us, there's a great quote. It's the cracks where the light gets in, and and there is a light here. And I, because we have the ear of so many CEOs. I mean, the Valuable Five Hundred was established actually to elevate the conversation and action and accountability around disability business inclusion to the board room table. Um, what we wanted to do was get the attention and intention of the world's most influential CEOs and their brands, right? That, that was our job because it was the missing piece. And despite the extraordinary success of, you know, 2012 and those games, you know, we still weren't seeing the accelerated change that we wanted. Um, and that missing piece has been business and business leadership. Um, we have some startling facts that still say that 90% of our companies who are committed to diversity, only 4% consider disability. 3% of the articles that we read talking about diversity only include disability. So we have a gap. But right now, as I was coming on to this call, we have 407 of the world's most influential CEOs in their brands. So can I give you a perspective on that? That is over 16 million employees, 5 trillion in revenue, 40 countries and 30, 56 sectors. I mean, it's huge. Now, what's happening? What's happening is kind of what happened that Mike was talking about in 2012 with the Paralympics. It's kind of happening in business now, right? In a way, I think the Valuable 500 is nearly like the Paralympics of business. And one thing that's very exciting is when you have the Paralympics go into partnership with something like the Valuable 500, which is just what we've done, and that is a moment of sweet collaboration because what we're starting to see in the Valuable 500, CEOs are coming to us. In the last 24 hours, we've had 10 huge brands. Now, I mean, big brands that you'd have dreamed of knocking down our door saying, save me a space, can I come in? And the reason they're doing that is three critical reasons. COVID has absolutely had mainstream exclusion on tap. We all have realized what it's like to have our wings slipped, to have our freedom taken away from us, and how actually the companies that have thrived in this, in this moment have been companies that are really about inclusion and have had the tools and the mindset and the accessibility to do it. So that's number one. The second one is that the CEOs are really understanding they don't want to react or be in a reactive situation again in the way that they are around Black Lives Matter. They know that disability business inclusion is not something that might be nice to have, or if it's going to happen, it's when it's going to happen. And they know they need to future-proof their bands. They know they need to learn. They need to learn that in community. And that's really important for them because they don't want to be caught again in that place. And the third thing is the younger generation. And the younger generation, 
through these the, the vehicles that we did not have, because I'm not a younger generation, um, through social media and a very strong voice around disability pride. This is pride now. And talking about disability as a source of innovation and growth. Look at Shrin. Look what, what Shrin has done. It's a perfect example. And we're seeing that this is not the conversation about making the case for business anymore. It's about capturing the opportunity, future-proofing our business, avoiding the risk for their brands if that they don't. And I think also is capturing this moment, this moment and this opportunity when you can be forgiven for not knowing at all, but you will not be forgiven for not doing something about it. No. So I think it's just a very exciting time. Thank you, Caroline. That, that's that's excellent. And we're going to come on to Srin in a minute. And I want to just sort of take what Caroline has said. And Toby, um, you know, you're a corporate advisor. Um, you know, you inclusion is the heart of what you do. Um, I just if you could talk to us about some of the practical measures you see companies are making to attract and promote an inclusive workforce, particularly where remote now remote working has become mainstream. Yes, yeah, so I think. I, so when I work with my clients, I, I really try and kind of simplify this for them. And I say, you know, your job as somebody working in HR, who are predominantly the customers that I work with, you know, your job is to identify and remove any speed humps or roadblocks that could prevent somebody who's disabled getting into your organization or progressing within your organization. So, you know, if you take something like your recruitment process, break that down into, into each individual step and then identify the speed humps or roadblocks that would prevent somebody from getting through your recruitment process. So for example, you know, if you expect everybody to upload CV online and fill out an online career, you know, on your careers website, if your careers website doesn't work with screen readers, for example, then that could prevent somebody who's uh, blind or visually impaired from being able to submit an application to work for you. If you have an insistence on doing face-to-face -face interviews, that might be difficult for somebody who's, for say, on the uh, who's autistic, that might struggle to have that kind of face-to-face -face time uh, in an interview setting. And you know, could there be another way of assessing their skills and abilities rather than relying on a face-to-face -face interview? So, in its simplistic sense, it's about kind of mapping out those journeys that people go on, and then trying to eliminate those speed humps and roadblocks. Uh, for individual people. It's taking a very human-centered approach to diversity and inclusion rather than, um, you know, rather than trying to fix the individual. It's about trying to fix the culture or the, the processes and systems within a business that slow people down or hold them back. Mm, yeah. Interesting. And so, Srin, let me come on to you. I mean, you're a, you're a terrific example of, a, of an entrepreneur who um, identified a gap in the market um, that nobody really saw in the travel industry. And what was even better, you did something about it. You built a technology travel company. Um, you sold it to Airbnb, I think too soon, but anyway, you did. Um, and then you became, went on to become a global head of accessibility at one of the most successful technology companies over the last decade. It is a remarkable story. Um, before we get into that, I want to just, um, you know, just tell us a little bit about that journey. But actually, more importantly, when you, you know, you, you, you're back from Silicon Valley. Um, and I think it'd be very interesting to, for, for the audience here today to hear about some of the attitudes and, and what it's like to be a disabled worker in Silicon Valley versus, versus what it's like here in the UK. Yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting question, Tim. And, and I got back to London um, in sort of December 2019 after just over two years in America. And it is, it is a question that I have spent a lot of time dwelling on. And I think there's, a, there's a, a couple of sort of key points here. I think sort of disability inclusion is, a, is, is, is something that covers both sort of the public policy sphere as in the help you get from the state, but also some of the more individual, the more kind of the rights and policies relating to the individual, like you know, do I have the right to 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 to, to require that there is accessibility at my local restaurant or bar or, or or whatever? And I think if I was to summarize, kind of you know, all the 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 the, the main take home messages, it'd be something along the lines of where it's about individual rights. I think that is very developed in America, thanks to the Americans with Disability Act and the kind of the the culture of advocacy and 
all the kind of the groups that have emerged to help people advocate for for their rights. So, you know, very rarely in America did I ever have to phone up and say, hey, you know, do you have uh, an accessible bathroom or is there a step to enter? And it was quite refreshing knowing that having to make that call was often an outlier type event. It would only be if I was, if I was going to somewhere in San Francisco that I know is a little bit older. And But again, it is very rare. But the flip side, and I think this is maybe sort of the darker side of America, is where you do need public support. So I don't think I would have been able to build a commable in America because to get to where to the point I have in life, I've been dependent all of my life on, on care support. Um, and predominantly that has been funded by the state. I have also been in need of support from the NHS for, for, for many parts of my life. Um, when I was first starting out as a solicitor, I had support from access to work in terms of transport and support services in the office. And that kind of public support is, is, is relatively non-existent in America. Um, you know, whether it be care funding, whether it be, you know, support to help to get you in the office or any adaptive requirements, these are usually, you know, things that maybe an employer, if they are generous enough, and I was fortunate to get that help from my employer, but it is the, very much the exception rather than the rule. And so in summary, it would be very much where it's about individual rights. I think America it is much more developed that way and, and asserting those rights. But when it comes to public support and public assistance, I think, you know, UK and sort of Europe in general is probably many years ahead on that front. Thanks, Rin. And, and I, just a follow on question, really, you know, as a tech entrepreneur, you, you went to, you went to the West Coast, you, uh, you, you, you spoke to a number of investors. Um, uh, and, you know, for those out there who are sort of listening today and thinking, yeah, I've got a great business idea. I want to build a business. I want to go and get some funding. Tell me some of the challenges as a disabled person in front of investors. Did you, were, you know, were there any sort of unusual challenges that you had to face? And is there any advice that you would give to our audience today? I think the most difficult challenge around fundraising on anything to do with accessibility, and I'm sure several on those on, the, on this panel probably have, have gone through that same journey. It is convincing sort of the holders of capital that there is a market opportunity here. Um, I think you know, humans do have natural bias and we are more likely to invest in things that we have direct experience of or problems that we have personally faced. And if as an investor, you are personally not aware of disability or it is not an issue that has been that has come up in day-to-day -day life of, of yourself or friends or family or whatever that may be, it is very difficult to then sort of instinctively relate to the challenges or even the opportunities in this, um, in this area. So I think convincing people that there was a, a venture, a venture scale opportunity in the accessibility space was, was tough. And, you know, we got there in the end and, you know, we did find people like yourselves who who are willing to support us. Um, but it was really tough, and I am hoping the story of Airbnb's acquisition in a comma board is it, now a case study, hopefully, for other entrepreneurs looking to fundraise in their sector. Um, just as as a proof point that big, large entities and big holders of capital do find this um, a viable and a viable business opportunity with. With the, necess with, with the necessary return that is available. Yeah, well, you know, all great credit to Airbnb for, for, for making that acquisition and then accelerating, you know, your higher purpose of what you wanted to do to accessible travel. So um, I think it's a wonderful story. Um, and it's also a great story about creativity. And I do believe in the current market and, and always generally, companies are crying out for innovation, creative thinking, adaptability, resilience. And I think of all those as sort of, wonderful traits um, of, 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 of disabled people. Um, and I, I'm just going to sort of, let's just focus in on that as a, as a subject about creative and creative and innovation. And Caroline, just bringing to you, you know, as you talk to CEOs, as you talk to corporates and, and you, you build this amazing network, creativity and innovation and, and unearthing the truth as well, how much is that an important part of your agenda? It's a huge point. I, I, I take Shrin's point um, just about the fundraising piece and, and really talking about the market. Um, and I understand the stories of fundraising as well. I have to say um, the market part is where we're going to make the connection 
for the CEOs around creativity. So just to give everybody a, a overview, I'm sure everybody already knows this, but the market of, of people with disabilities and their families, which is 72% of our global consumer base. So let me say that again, 72% of our global consumer base. Now, don't tell me there isn't a CEO ain't interested in that. They just didn't know that, okay? Well, that is worth about 8 trillion. Uh, and so when you're hearing figures like that, so how does a CEO, you know, when you're making the case for them on this, how can, how can they serve that market creatively and competitively? So what they do, what they're starting to see now is there a, is there a connection of having people like Shrin in the business so that they bring Shrin into the business because the intelligence to serve that market to get competitive advantage. We also forget small anecdotes that we know that, you know, the, the, the remote control was designed for visually impaired people to watch television. Not that we can see the television, but there you go. That, you know, text messaging for people that were hearing impaired and we all use it. These little anecdotes are starting to become much more mainstream. But the big piece is about the market and about understanding that people with disabilities have creative ways of differentiating in a market. And that has been proved again in COVID. And there's something else I just want to bring up, another stat that is extraordinary to me, is when Richard Branson came out and started talking about his dyslexia, he would say, for a long time, he didn't really speak about it, but then he would start to frame it as his superpower, his creative superpower. Now, when he did that, you could see people going, okay, well, thank you, but there's 7% of our CEOs 7% of them have a lived experience of disability before out of five of them are hiding it. So you are all in the business of working with leaders, all right? That's your business. So if you think about it, a lot of leaders have a lived experience of disability or a family member, but that's a creativity that they're hiding away or they're using, but they're not acknowledging. And I just kind of feel we're at that time right now that we're going to start hearing these stories coming out more because the business needs and knows that it needs to be to bring that creativity into itself to serve its consumer base so it's a very exciting time for that yeah and Karen, just just for 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 the audience to to better understand when you talk about lived experience of uh, disability just explain exactly what you mean by that yeah i it's, it's probably sounds very pc shrin will you jump in with me if i'm being over pc here look the, when we say lived experience the stats around disabilities 1.3 billion people have a current currently have a disability physical sensory learning disability or mental health and this is under the un convention so it's one tiny word to describe so much but so you also know that 80 percent of disability is invisible and 80 percent of disability is acquired between the ages of 18 and 64. disability does not discriminate it can touch any one of us at any point in our life and then lastly all of us are going to have some disability at some form so i think that's the stats shrin have i got them all right <laughs> uh, he's, on, he's on he's on mute at the moment but uh, i'm sure that's not um but i think they were right yeah so i was just saying that i need to remind myself to always take it off mute at the, the story <laughs> of the pandemic right yeah that's who well. but that's um, the scale of the mark tim that's the scale of the market we're speaking to you see yeah. this isn't a conversation anymore about making the case for disabled people and it's a worthy and a good thing to do Mike Best said this, and anyway, they have the third highest viewing figures, or is it the second, in the world for any event. Seriously, this is about marketing, it's brand around differentiation. Yeah. Well, let's go back to the world of sport, because um, I was on a webinar uh, about a month ago, Mike, I think it was towards the end of last year, and you had a number of your elite athletes on the on the call, and I was just amazed by their you know, how they coped with the pandemic and um, particularly around the words of innovation and resilience and so on. Uh, perhaps you can give some sort of real life examples of, of, you know, some of the people you know in your world and how they've been able to, you know, to adapt and perhaps some of those lessons that we can learn from from these athletes um, in, in, the, in the corporate world. Yeah, uh, thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess to say COVID has been incredibly challenging for many of our athletes, um, but I think in the same breath, I think they would all say that COVID is much bigger than sport, and, and they know that. And there are many people facing much more significant challenges, you know, in, in particular those that are fighting the disease at the at the front end of the, the NHS. So I think I think every every elite athlete sort of understands that bigger picture. 
but there have been some incredible challenges. I mean, there's a, a very wide range of, of, of disabilities that we have within the, the elite athletes. Um, some of our athletes have been shielding more or less since last March you know, at home. And, and, and all of them have had to find new creative ways to, uh, to, to prepare for Tokyo. I mean, there's, there's, there's one thing in common. They're all still, no matter what, preparing for Tokyo. Um, we, we um, you know, adapting their training programs. We, we announced our um, shooting team last week um, and it was a moment of excitement. It, these were the first, uh, the, the six members of the shooting team, the, and actually they're the first six members of the Paralympics GB team for Tokyo. So a really exciting, exciting moment. If you go onto the BBC disability site, you will see a nice little video of Ryan, uh, one of our shooters, um, who stuck at home and he his challenge that he sort of set himself over the winter was how am i going to how am i going to get a 10 meter shooting range inside my house um, and so what he what he does he sits in his wheelchair in his bathroom he has the bedroom door open and he fires his rifle from his bathroom through his bedroom and he had to take the window out of his bedroom and insert a long cylindrical tube which then connects with a shed in his garden and the, the, the target is on the far end of his shed. So that gives him a perfect, perfect 10 meter range. And it's just a wonderful example of the kind of creativity that we're seeing across the athletes. Um, good humor as well. There's a lot of, there's a lot of humor there, but, but underpinned by this incredible resilience. Um, and, and in a sense, as Caroline was saying earlier, this is, we've all had to sort of reconfigure our lives somewhat, haven't we, over the last year? And probably not quite to the extent that Ryan has, but but we've all had to make adaptations and change change the way we do things. And for many people, I guess what's been interesting is that in a sense, we're, we're sort of facing, facing the restrictions that many disabled people face on a daily basis. And um, and that's just been really interesting. And what's been interesting is to see how business has responded to that. And, and I would say business has responded brilliantly. If you think about the way technology caught up, with, it took about a week for Zoom and Teams to kind of get to where we where we needed to be. Um, but more than that, I think the flexibility that almost every business has has said, well, we need you know we need to build this in to allow people to. To, to, to be able to work effectively. So we've had so much more flexibility. And from our own experience at the BPA, I think people are feeling very valued as a result of that. And um, I think I think there's an opportunity. Well, the, I guess there's a the, the challenge, there, there's a challenge and there's an opportunity. So the challenge, I guess, is uh, is what we how much of that we choose to hold on to going forward um because it would be very easy to slip back into the old ways and but but clearly the opportunity is there for everybody and every single business uh to think about how much of that they do want to hold on to and think about how they can create a more inclusive environment not just for disabled people actually for everybody um everybody has has stuff that they uh, that they that they need to take care of in their lives and mm -hmm. If you would have said a year ago, could we could we do our business effectively with this amount of flexibility? I think many people would have said no, but I think we've just proved that's not the case. Mm. That, that's really interesting, and um, I, I think this this adaptability thing is a, is a really important component, um, uh, particularly as organisations absolutely need to make changes. Um, Toby, I want to bring you in because you know you you always describe when I, when we talk, you always say to me, I'm a very practical person. Um, and you give very solid practical advice to your clients. Just in the sort of the last year, what sort of obvious practical changes do you think companies have made um, in order to create that inclusivity, particularly around disabled inclusivity? Yeah, so it's been quite interesting to see how organizations have, have shifted. Um, I think what I found most interesting is how quickly organizations can change. Um, I've worked with clients who have taken their time to introduce changes to their organization. But when when we hit the first lockdown last year, in a week or two, they were able to move their business online. They were able to move all of their workforce to be able to work remotely when before there was this emphasis um, of um, 
you know, being present in the office. So I think that's demonstrated that that we can do it and that change is possible. Um, I think what's interesting is that there has been um, a lot of interest. I think this because of the focus of of moving stuff online. I think that has definitely increased the conversation from businesses about making um, online experiences more accessible for people. So, for example, you know, I've got clients who have been thinking they're still recruiting and they're thinking about what their onboarding experience looks like. And now that's an online experience. Um, and they're asking questions like, well, you know, if we're expecting people to log on and use this particular system, how can we ensure everybody can use that system? You know, if somebody's deaf or blind, for example, how can they still complete the tasks online? Um, so I have seen things like companies talking more about auditing their digital real estate to make sure that it's accessible and compliant, for instance. And then they've gone out and got those audits completed and then put the, the fixes in place. Um, so I'm seeing that kind of thing happen. Yeah. Well, uh, um, Shrin, um, you know, you've always been, uh, our discussions have always been around creativity and innovation. And um, without giving too many secrets away, as an entrepreneur looking for the next big thing, um, uh, you know, what's, what's whizzing through your mind? What have you been seeing, particularly in the last year, uh, in terms of opportunities out there? Oh, I mean, you know, there's never, I think the one slightly reassuring thing, like, I mean, entrepreneurs solve problems and I don't think there's ever a shortage of problems in the world, like regrettably. Um, and so, you know, I think you've got an entire spectrum of things. I think let's just say we're sort of taking sort of the subject matter today around accessibility. So what we did in travel is just one category. Um, I think there are multiple categories, whether it be access to transportation or even, you know, slightly unrelated areas like access to better financial services or um, other areas or sort of leisure. It, I think each one of those are a category in itself where there is, I think, a huge opportunity for much better products and services. And uh, I think that a very much an underlying appetite from, from, from disabled consumers to have better services. And I think sort of, you know, big picture, you've got all the sort of the mega trends of the world happening at the moment with a move to remote and everything becoming digitized and moving online. And I think the way sort of one, one mentor of mine put this is sort of imagine the world in 2030, but that has now been brought forward by nine years. And I think, you know, the, the changes that were in place that were already happening at a certain scale have now just been accelerated by, by a massive order of magnitude. And I think as much as, you know, the, the, the natural optimist in me is seeing, you know, oh, yes, this is, I think, a really opportune time for building business. I, th I think the one sort of word of caution that I am concerned about is when you do have periods of accelerated change that also then create probably new, new regrettable vectors for, for, for accelerating maybe certain disadvantages and inequalities um, that, 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 that came into being. So, for instance, um, you know, technology workers, I think, have, 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 if anything, have done okay during the pandemic and have, because they've already got used to working from home. It's in the knowledge industry. Everything you need is already online, whereas those who may not be uh, working in such industries have really struggled. And I think it's, it's really important that some of those inequalities aren't, we don't lose sight of those in the bigger picture in this sort of new entrepreneurial world that, that, is, that is going to emerge. Mm. Interesting. Um, and, and I guess, you know, as we look forward, um, Caroline, um, you know, uh, if you think about, you know, what, what your organization is doing, um, you know, what, what are the sort of the, the fundamental changes do you want to to make? But uh, and, and um, how, you know, engaging with CEOs, it's, it's talk is one thing, but action is another thing. And um, I don't know. Can you sort of shine a light on disability within leadership and within boards, and and really what is going on? Not very much. Um, before the Valuable Five Hundred, um, EY did some research. It said fifty four percent of our boards at, at these global companies had never had a conversation about disability. So that's quite shocking. Yeah. It's kind of one of the reasons that we exist. Um, so I think what we're doing is, so the first thing was to, listen, this was a campaign that was going to break the silence on leadership. 
and we've got there we've we've done a campaign but we're now moving to a phase two <laughs> so um you know what you always have a master plan in your head particularly if you're a troublemaking entrepreneur and so you, you do it bite-sized chunks right you don't tell everybody you don't show your underwear from the outset you just you kind of take it slowly so the first thing was to get them into the community and show them listen this is a safe space you can we can get there better quicker faster share best practice and learn and take this idea of disability inclusion from the CHROs into a cross-functional accountability that is led by the board and the CEO. So what we've designed to do in phase two, because these are the things that business have come back to us to say. So what I want to do, and the people that are working with us is, I don't want anything less than radically transforming the business system, right? I unapologetically say we want to shake the system up, not just for disability, but for everyone, that we stop categorizing our humanity into little bite sized chunks that compete against each other. And so this is what the next phase of the Valley Wolf 500 do. It will give we will put into the hands of the CEOs the accountability to work across leadership, culture, brand, very important, research, reporting and representation. And the one piece that I can definitely tell you is going to change this game is reporting. And that is when we start having reporting on disability performance at board level, accountable by the CEO, and then externally, we can no longer have sustainability indexes, diversity and inclusion index, best performance indexes if we do not have disability metrics. Because it's the old adage, what gets measured gets done, and what doesn't get measured definitely doesn't get done. So that's the push to be fair to the CEOs, they're asking for it, because yeah. it helps them um, and take, and I think it was Toby who mentioned about auditing, they kind of want to know now how. So our job is to put into their hands the solutions that help them, the Tobys in the world, to give them the shrins to show that this is where innovation is, to put them in front of the mics to say, this is an opportunity for your brand enhancement and to create an ecosystem that helps them not go from the intention, but to the action. And that's what phase two is all about. But if I'd started with that, they'd have run a mile. So we have to start slowly. And, and um, measuring, how, how do companies currently measure and how, and how do you want them to measure? Because I mean, it's a, that's a big challenge. Oh, it's, 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 it's one of the ones like, this is where I feel slightly geeky because everybody forgets I'm an ex-management consultant with Accenture, God bless them. They employed me and they didn't know I was blind. Um, so I'd love to hear what Toby has to say about this. But one of the things that we are really struggling with is what metrics? What metrics do we put in? And therefore, that conversation has been, oh, it's just too hard, hard and complicated, so we won't do it at all. But James Harding's Tortoise Responsibility Index was the first that we've helped to put metrics into. And they, it was based on the disclosures that company put in on air public accounts. So that's the beginning part. But we're also working with Refinitiv, who are working with the Fortune 500 companies on move to measure around racial representation. So we've challenged them and said, if you can do it for this, you can do it for disability. We've got to hack this system. I know there's legislation, but there are ways and means around doing it. So it's getting the, the brightest brains in the world to come up with a solution. Um, and uh, uh, um, uh, I'm going to now open up this, 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 this. We've got a few minutes. We've got 15 minutes left before we, before we close out. And we've got some questions coming in now. Um, I've got one sort of big picture question here that I'm going to um, I don't know. I'll, I'll I'll ask I'll ask all of you actually. You know, where 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 does what does disability inclusion look like in ten years time? Um, uh, who wants to? Who wants? Caroline, you you what? You, you're smiling. Why don't, why don't you have a crack? That I don't exist actually would be amazing. But you wouldn't have to listen to this over talker. That would be that would be brilliant. I tell you what, disability business inclusion would mean the Paralympics is integrated into the Olympics. Would love that. That there is no standalone standards for disability. That disability, um, people will be, have a lived experience of disability, but talking about anything other than disability in the media. I would love that. I mean, it's about normalizing and integrating disability inclusion into our societies and that we stop having to do this kind of stuff. Yeah. Toby, you're practical. What would you like to see? Um, for me, I think it's about normalizing disability. So from a personal perspective, perspective you know I've worked in huge organizations employing tens of thousands of people yet I've been the only person in the building who's in a wheelchair um, and you know it's it's always a nice surprise to see somebody else 
turn, turn up in a wheelchair sometimes and so you know it'll be good to work in an organization where you know I just see other people like me basically and that, but that's more from a kind of personal perspective and my, my experience of working in corporations mm -hmm. and, and Mike do you, do you have a, a sort of a big vision as to um and, and actually while I asked that question as well you know you've um, hopefully 2021 Tokyo 2020 is going to come along and you know that's always a wonderful stage to you know to make a big difference in, in society so you know what, what, how do you th see things in the future um well uh yeah so first of all uh, we're still really positive that Tokyo 2021 is going to happen and we're working really hard to make sure uh, we get our 240 athletes out there safely. Um, um, but looking ahead, so I guess we could sort of look at LA 28, which sort of not quite fits 10 years, but what would we what would we want for LA 28? Well, I, I guess there are a couple of things. One is, I think, to be honest, I think that is a huge opportunity for the Paralympic movement to get America to realize what an amazing thing this is, because it hasn't quite got there yet. Um, and I think there's a massive opportunity for glo globally uh, for the US to get behind the Paralympics. Uh, it, and, and I think LA will be when they choose to do that. And we've seen the American broadcasters um, who 10 years ago were sort of more or less ex completely ignoring it, um, realizing that actually this is something which is quite interesting. Um, but I think in 28, they'll realize how amazing it is. Um, I, the other thing I guess I might say is, you know, we people are still very interested in all of the Paralympians stories. You know, how did they become disabled? How did actually in 28, I think let's just focus on the amazing athletes that they are. And I think if we get to that point, that will be brilliant. Yeah. Interesting. And I mean, yeah, I, I've been in the executive search industry for, for a number of years, as I mentioned earlier. And um, one of the things I, I guess corporate leaders might be saying is, you know, I understand, um, you know, there's a talent pool out there. Um, but I sort of don't know how to re I don't know how to find it. Um, I don't know how to include disabled people on my shortlists or find them so that I can include them on my shortlist so that they can be front and center for my hiring needs. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, Caroline or Toby, um, uh, you know, what, what, what have you seen? Um, because I think that is quite a challenge. I mean, uh, there's clearly a talent pool out there, but I think accessing and reaching out to that talent pool has been a big issue so far. Yes, yeah, so I think for me, I suppose I often advise that take it in. You're on mute, Toby. Oh, yeah, I was. Um, oh, again. No, I've lost Toby. Okay. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I don't know what happened. I don't know what. He's gone again. Somebody's been taken out. <laughs> yeah, it keeps it keeps muting itself. Um, right, yeah. So um, I I often advise taking an inside out approach. So um, yeah. making sure that as an employer, you um, get your house in order and you're able to then project out uh, an inclusive place to work. Um, the thing is, there's no silver bullet. So there's, there, you have to kind of do a few things um, in order to kind of be more disability inclusive. And I think, um, Fair enough. yeah, partly um, uh, looking at how you do your outreach, for example. Um, so depending on what uh, what roles you're recruiting as well, you know, if you're recruiting uh, at a very local level, you know, you could form partnerships with local disabled people's organizations for example to in invite invitations to apply to work for you um if you're kind of doing that exec um head hunting um we keep losing right, i have no idea what's going on my line just... <laughs> well I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna pass over that yeah. question to Caroline, and, and you what? know when you're talking to ceos and boards and you're saying you know we want to make a difference. You need to make a difference. And they ask you that question. What's your answer? Well, I, I think Toby was saying exactly what I would say. Um, um, but I also want to say it's actually a very common thing businesses are saying. They are saying that. We can't find you. Where do we find people like you? So the second thing I build on what to, uh, Toby was saying is um, my, my, my Channel 4 after the 2012 Games, because it was so successful, they did an internal campaign. 
they thought that 3% of their employees had a disability. And after doing this confidential census that was done by Graham Whippy, they discovered it was just under 12%. Now that's really interesting to, to always point about get your house in order because actually we estimate most likely based on stats that most of our organizations would have anything between 10 to 15 percent of their employees with a disability. Microsoft just released a report in early December. They did that confidential census globally and they got 6.1 percent. So I wonder what does that do like when we have that information and we realize oh my gosh look we have people with disabilities already in our organization and they haven't told us but what can we learn from them so that we can attract more of that talent i'm just wondering i think there's a, there's a kind of an obvious opportunity here that we probably all could be doing and it's one of the things i really want our valuable 500 companies to do that we're designing that confidential census so they can all use it so that they don't the the issue of of legislation that doesn't ask us or it, it tells us that you cannot ask about having a disability could be over mm. overridden i don't know what toby think i just i think that's a really interesting opportunity yes i i've just realized what was going on so this is a disability story i had my assistive technology turned on my laptop <laughs> um and it was interfering with this software so um yeah i think um i, I think my my clients certainly that I work with um, employ more uh, people with disabilities than they than they know or they realise, because one of the things I do with my clients is is run a, a, an inclusion survey to find out what their employees are feeling about the culture of the organisation, and we do measure diversity you know metrics, and my clients are always surprised that they get more people declaring a disability in that survey than they thought. Um, plus, we also need to recognise that. You know, we have an aging workforce and we get disabilities with age as well. So um, I did see um, a, a comment in the chat box earlier that um, I think it was from, um, uh, where is it from? So I think it was Mike Smith who said about reasonable adjustments um, benefiting all staff. Um, and I think that's the kind of mindset that we need to shift to in terms of normalizing disability. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if you've got say compulsory training that your staff have to do, um, you know, I've worked in an organization where the compulsory training didn't come with subtitles. So my, my deaf colleague wasn't able to complete the training and was getting into trouble for not complete, being able to complete the training. Um, but actually, um, if we added subtitles, not only would it benefit him, it would benefit people who are working in a noisy environment, say on client site. It would benefit people who didn't bring their headphones to work, or maybe their headphones have broken. It would benefit people where English is their second language. Um, so actually, you know, it has a huge benefit for a lot more people. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, and um, yeah, I'm conscious of time here. We've got a few more questions, but I've got a mic. Um, you know, I'm thinking about para athletes who have been in the limelight, you know, being at the top of their game, and then they trash transition from being, you know, no, they're no longer an athlete, and they're no longer at the top of their game in the sporting world. How do you prepare them into perhaps the business world? And have you got some examples of, um, of para athletes who have then gone into the business world and, and been uh, and really sort of um, influence change? Um, I think so the answer is yes, but probably not as many as we should have. And I think there's something that we we can and should do much more of. Um, and so it, this is something that's really high on our agenda to uh, to see. And it's something we're going to be starting this year is how do we start to equip athletes during whilst they're still athletes and whilst they're thinking about the transition uh, with the sort of skills that will that they will need to uh, to succeed. Um, so we've got some quite exciting plans that we're going to be looking to launch a little bit later. Um, but I think that the kind of skills that it takes to be a top performing Paralympic athlete, there is no doubt that those qualities are hugely uh, valued by business. Um, and it is just a question of trying to make find the right way to make those connections. Uh, we have many Paralympic athletes who are working with businesses they work with businesses during their careers either as brand ambassadors 
or they go they go along and they and and they do talks in businesses. So the links are all there. But I think we just need to get much better at um, at, at making that happen um, and getting more more of them into work. Yeah, and these are great qualities that, that people have. And in fact, there's a question here from Grace from the panel saying, you know, what is the one important step that businesses can take to help normalize disability? Um, Shrin, I, I wonder whether you could, um, you know, you could answer that question. I mean, apart from bringing in Toby and Caroline to help, I think well, once, once that bit's done, um, I think that sort of, I think that the challenge there is it, it's not a, it's, it's, there isn't a, a, a smoking gun, regrettably. Like it is a it is a collection of, of interventions and changes and a cultural a journey of cultural change that, that that must happen, which I think is part of the challenge as why this can be, you know, it, it can be a difficulty, like because it isn't just something a turnkey overnight thing, but it is the start of a journey. And I think you know, there's lots of like bits of low hanging fruit, whether it be you know, reviewing policies thinking about how you can have more disabled people in the workforce or even as Toby alluded to just making it easier for people to declare and giving them that comfort that they can identify as disabled and they, they have that comfort to do so so there is a, a bigger sort of voice um, at, at, at the table so I think unfortunately I don't have an, an, a, a one answer to this I think it's a there are multiple answers and I think it's more about a commitment to start on that journey more than anything yeah Okay, thank you for that. Um, so um, we're running out of time, unfortunately, and I know that we could talk for a lot longer on this in, in such a great topic. And I, so these insights that you guys have brought to this conversation from different perspectives is, is really invaluable, and I'm delighted that we've recorded it. But just to finish and summarize, in 2021, um, I'm gonna start with you, Caroline. What's your top priority for businesses this year? Um, to convert the intention and the commitment that we've had at the Valuable 500 into action and to join the dots, shake up the system and make this pandemic worth something good. That's yeah. for me. Okay. And, and Toby, what, what's your one priority as a, as a, as a consultant um, working with corporates? You know, what is your one top priority this year? What do you want to see happen? So for me, I'm, I mean, I'm working with HR directors predominantly. And, and for me, it's about getting them to think about how diversity and inclusion is an enabler of growth for their organization. And and it, that's really important right now because businesses are going through a really difficult time because of the pandemic, but they need to grow out of this very difficult time, but they can, we've effectively hit the reset button. They can do that with a diverse workforce in order to, to get much better results. Mm. And uh, Mike, you know, uh, potentially a huge, huge year ahead. So what is your big priority for this year? Uh, well, I guess the big priority is for us to get a best prepared team to Tokyo and so that every athlete can shine and, and in on the stage in Tokyo. And we do that very clearly because we, we know that the, the, the better the performance, um, the more inspiration we're going to create to to make change happen. I think there's something more though that we're hoping for this year is that just by being there is going to be a celebration in itself. It will be the world coming back together again, and there will be some there will be a sort of feeling of humanity celebrating the fact that uh, a common show of resilience to come back together. And I think so that's going to be exciting. Uh, and and then I guess finally, um, COVID has sort of highlighted some quite deep divides across the country as well you know and I think that's been one of the sad things that we've seen whether it's economic or political or geographic and the Paralympics is one of those things that that brings people together and so my hope is if we get if we do our bit right then the Paralympics will be something that brings people back together again and helps to create a, you know, a kinder more connected um, yeah. And, and inclusive inclusive society because that's that's what we want to do great and i know we're running out of time Shrin. i don't want to miss you out um no um I, just keep it sort of short and sweet. I think you know it is advocating that sort of this is the year where it has to sort of be actions mm. rather than words i think there is a massive inflection change reset button sort of whichever adjective to use but i think it would be an awful tragedy if that did not allow us that to, to, to deal with sort of issues that have been just building up for a very long time. So now is the time to start dealing with them. 
That's that's fantastic. Well, Toby, Mike, um, Caroline, and Shrin, thank you very much, and um, you know, for this great, great conversation. Um, you know, really, really delighted for you to share your insights. Um, also, thank you to our audience who have um, joined us today. I hope you've enjoyed the conversation. As I said, it will be uploaded onto YouTube um, and uh, it will uh, also be sent out to you after this. Um, but if you want to carry on the conversation and you want to make change in your own organization, um, do get in touch with our panelists, get in touch with us as well. Um, we're here to make change happen. Um, and thank you again very much for joining us and enjoy the rest of the day. Um, thank you very much, the panelists. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.